Doc Holiday. I'm your Huckleberry. A great line from our favorite Doc Holiday, Val Kilmer in the 1993 film Tombstone. It has been said that Doc killed between 16 and 30 men. Doc also claimed to almost been hung four times and ambushed five times more. He really is the stuff of legend. But much of it isn't true, or at least can't be proven. Think you know Doc Holliday from books and movies? You're a daisy if you do. Let's start at the beginning. Henry Burroughs Holliday, Doc's father, was a veteran of the Indian War, the Mexican War, and later the Civil War. On January 8th, 1849, Major Holliday married Alice Jane McKee, and they settled in the town of Griffin, Georgia. Henry had a drugstore in Griffin, Georgia. They were also very well-respected members of their community. Major Holliday is credited by the Lowndes County Historical Society as being the first clerk of courts for Spalding County, Georgia. He was also the mayor of Valdosta, Georgia, twice. And it's said he introduced the pecan industry to the area. Alice was well-educated. Musically talented and from a well-to-do family. Henry and Alice had their first child on December 3rd, 1849. A daughter they named Martha Eleonora. Infant mortality rates were much higher in those days, and baby Martha only lived to be six months old, dying in June of 1850. Then, on August 14th, 1851, their first son was born, and named John Henry. He would be known later and forever as Doc Holliday. Yep, Doc was born in Georgia. At birth, John Henry had a birth defect. It said it was a cleft lip or palate. His mother was totally devoted to him and worked tirelessly to provide him with therapy and teach him in his younger years. The two formed a very strong bond. When his mother died of tuberculosis, called consumption in those days, John was only 15 years old and absolutely devastated. His father remarried just three short months later and moved the family to Valdosta, Georgia. John Henry attended the Valdosta Institute. John was very smart and apparently had very good grades in class. In 1870, when John Henry Holliday was 19 years old, he left home to start dental school in Philadelphia. He would receive his degree as Doctor of Dental Surgery from the Pennsylvania College of Dental Surgery on March 1, 1872. He moved to Atlanta and opened a dental office with Arthur Ford. Things were looking good, but a few months later he was diagnosed with tuberculosis and told he only had a few months to live. He may have gotten the disease from his mother, but this is not known for certain. The dry air of the West was recommended for tuberculosis patients, and John Henry may have decided to head West for his health. All we know is that he left Atlanta and showed up in Dallas, Texas. He was 23 years old. It may be in Dallas that John Henry became Doc Holliday. He tried to practice as a dentist there, but his illness made it difficult. The Anything Goes city of Dallas, the last city before the real frontier, had all sorts of experiences available, and Doc took advantage of them, and it seems they got a hold of him. Drinking and gambling were Doc's pastime, and he gained a reputation as a pretty good card player with a pretty short temper. Professional gambling was a popular profession in those days, and Doc seemed to have a knack for it. In Dallas, he is said to have practiced with guns and knives, and embellished his own reputation. Doc wasn't the only gambler to do this. Having a well-known reputation for a nasty temper or being a quick draw with a gun or a knife could offer some protection. There was trouble here and there, and Doc may have left a town or two in a hurry. 1874, Dallas. Doc and 12 others were indicted for illegal gambling. In 1875 in Dallas, Doc was in a gunfight. He was arrested, but since no one had been injured, he was released. He fled to Fort Griffin and was arrested for illegal gambling again. 
Next came Colorado, where he found trouble in a knife fight with fellow gambler Bud Ryan. While both had used knives, Doc was unhurt while Ryan was seriously wounded. He moved to Wyoming to take advantage of the gold rush, then back to Texas. On July 4, 1877, Doc beat gambler Henry Kahn with his walking stick, and both men were arrested and fined. Kahn was still worked up and shot Doc later the same day. Doc was so seriously wounded that a newspaper reported, incorrectly, that he had been killed. Doc met Wyatt Earp for the first time in 1877 in Texas. Wyatt was tracking down a gang that had robbed the Santa Fe Railroad construction camp. In a bar in Fort Griffin, Wyatt saw a well-dressed, well-spoken man with a horrible cough dealing cards. That man was Doc Holliday. Doc offered to deal Wyatt into a game, but Wyatt was more interested in questioning him about the gang he was looking for. Then in 1878, Fate changed Doc's life in two ways. In Dodge City, Kansas, he would save the life of and become lifelong friends with Wyatt Earp, and he would meet the woman who would become his common-law wife. There are two versions of the story of Doc and Wyatt meeting again, and both are worth telling. In the first version, a man in a saloon pulled a gun on Wyatt behind his back. Doc yelled a warning before the man could fire, and before Wyatt could do anything about it, Doc fired and killed the unnamed man, saving Wyatt's life. The second version goes something like this. Several cowboys, the story changes depending on the source, and states from three to a dozen or more, were harassing customers in the saloon where Doc was playing cards. Wyatt heard the commotion, and when he entered the saloon and found himself surrounded by these men, Doc drew his gun and held it to the head of one of the cowboys freeing Wyatt from a bad situation. No mention of any disturbance like this appears in any of the Dodge City newspapers of the time, so the second version, a smaller number of troublemakers, seems more likely. Whatever the real story is, Wyatt Earp said Doc saved his life that day, and a friendship that lasted the rest of Doc's days started. Fate also brought the only woman Doc had a long-term adult relationship with to his attention in 1878 in Dodge City. Kate Elder was known as Big Nose Kate. She had been born November 9, 1849 in Hungary. Her family immigrated to the United States and settled in Davenport, Iowa. In 1862, Kate's father and stepmother both died. Kate ran away at age 16 and headed to St. Louis by stowing away on a riverboat. There were few ways for young women to earn money, and Kate was said to have been a dance hall girl and brothel worker. Doc said Kate was his intellectual equal. High praise from a college-educated man. She was smart, stubborn, independent, and had a temper as short as Doc's. Doc and Kate had a volatile relationship. They fought, broke up, and made up multiple times through the years. They moved from place to place, with Doc practicing dentistry during the day for the first few months, then gambling, dealing faro, and drinking through the night. Kate sometimes supplemented their income by working in dance halls. When Doc and Kate weren't getting along, they sometimes lived apart, often in other states, but they seemed to always reunite eventually. Tombstone was one of those towns where the liquor flowed, barmaids were plentiful, gambling was abundant, and the silver boom was in full effect. Tombstone was really a boom town. Virgil Earp was a lawman in Prescott, Arizona, when he heard about the opportunities in the town of Tombstone. He wrote a letter to his brother Wyatt about it. Wyatt, who had been a lawman in Kansas, came to town in 1879. Younger brother Morgan and Doc Holliday came in 1880. The Earps had mining claims all over Tombstone and also made money, probably most of it, gambling. Wyatt managed the faro tables at the Oriental Saloon in Tombstone and was deputized as a law enforcer by Virgil after he became the town marshal in 1880. 
Morgan was deputized as well. When the Earps arrived in Tombstone, they discovered the town was basically being run by an outlaw gang known as the Clanton Gang or the Cowboys. They were cattle rustlers, thieves, and murderers. Ike Clanton and Billy Clanton, Frank and Tom McClowry, Billy Claiborne, and Johnny Ringo, as well as assorted Clanton ranch hands and others belonged to the gang. They covered territory from Arizona to New Mexico and south over the border with Mexico wrestling cattle, robbing stagecoaches, and committing murder. They had tombstone cowering, and their activities went unchallenged until the Earp brothers came to town. Virgil Earp was not about to let this gang of criminals go unchecked. After several run-ins with members of the gang, including Ike Clanton threatening to kill Wyatt, and the gang spreading rumors that Doc had been involved in a stagecoach robbery and murder, the stage was set for a showdown. On October 26, 1881, Virgil arrested Ike Clanton and Tom McClowry for carrying guns within the city limits, which was illegal. After they were fined and released, Tom and Ike met up with Billy Clanton and Frank McLowry in town. Virgil saw an opportunity to disarm Billy and Frank and asked Wyatt and Morgan to assist him. Doc at this point told the Earps he would be going with them. Virgil deputized Doc after the brothers could not talk him out of participating. On Fremont Street, between Fly's Photo Gallery and Jersey's Livery Stable, near but not actually at the OK Corral, Doc Holliday, Virgil, Wyatt, and Morgan Earp confronted Ike and Billy Clanton, Tom and Frank McClowry, and Billy Claiborne. The Earp brothers and Doc demanded the Cowboys surrender their weapons. Instead, the shooting started. 30 shots were fired in 30 seconds. Billy Claiborne and Ike Clanton ran when the shooting began. Billy Clanton shot Morgan Earp in the leg and Virgil Earp in the shoulder. Tom McClowry was killed by a blast from Doc's shotgun. A bullet grazed Doc's hip. Frank McClowry was shot in the stomach by Doc and then in the head by either Doc or Morgan. Billy Clanton was shot in the right side and arm, but kept shooting left-handed. He died 30 minutes after the shootout ended. Virgil and Morgan Earp and Doc Holliday recovered from their wounds. They were arrested for the murder of Billy Clanton, Tom McClowry, and Frank McClowry but the judge on the case decided they were justified in their actions, and the Cowboys continued to torment them. On December 28, 1881, Virgil Earp was ambushed and shot in a murder attempt by the gang. Then on March 18, 1882, a Cowboy member fired from a dark alley into the saloon where Morgan was playing billiards, killing him. White Earp swore vengeance, and Doc was with him all the way. He was indeed Wyatt's Huckleberry, there no matter what the danger, for whatever needed to be done. Wyatt had recently been appointed Deputy U.S. Marshal and deputized Doc and a number of other men into a federal posse. They tracked and chased those they thought were responsible for Virgil's injuries and Morgan's death. They killed Frank Stilwell, who was waiting to ambush Virgil as he boarded the train for California. The posse killed three other cowboys during late March and early April of 1882. With their work in Tombstone finished, Doc and Wyatt left, swearing never to return. They rode to New Mexico territory and caught a train to Colorado. Although extradition to Arizona was filed against Doc, the Earps had friends in high places, and the governor of Colorado refused to extradite Doc. Doc supposedly spent the rest of his days in Colorado, but an incident in early July of 1882 makes one wonder. Doc's sworn enemy, Johnny Ringo, was found dead in Arizona from a gunshot wound to the head. A gun was supposedly found in Ringo's hand. Friends of Doc swore he had not left Colorado, and the matter was eventually laid to rest. Some say Doc and Wyatt made one last secret trip to Arizona together to finish unfinished business but it cannot be proven that they had anything to do with Ringo's death. Doc's remaining days were relatively quiet. Doc and Wyatt had a falling out and didn't see each other for a very long time. Apparently Doc said something, maybe in a drunken state, that Wyatt just could not let rest. 
And it's said that Doc never forgave himself for it. In the winter of 1885, in the lobby of the Windsor Hotel in Denver, Doc saw his friend Wyatt for the last time. Doc was obviously sick, coughing continuously and unsteady on his feet. As his health continued to deteriorate, he moved to the Hotel Glenwood in Glenwood Springs, Colorado. The area had sulfur hot springs and was popular for tuberculosis patients. The posh hotel was to be his last home. His last two months were spent in bed, and he was delirious towards the end. Then, on November 8th, 1887, he woke clear-headed and asked for a glass of whiskey, which he is said to have thoroughly enjoyed. He looked down at his feet and said, This is funny, and died. He was 36 years old. He is buried at the Glenwood Springs Pioneer Cemetery. Doc may have been called the deadly dentist. It's said he killed up to 30 men. But his friends and associates and history tell a different story about John Henry Doc Holliday. Despite the reputation he had as a deadly gunslinger, Doc Holliday only had eight shootouts in his entire lifetime. And it can only be confirmed that he killed two people. Virgil Earp said in an interview, Tales were told that he murdered men in different parts of the country, that he robbed and committed all manners of crimes, and yet when persons were asked how they knew it, they could only admit that it was hearsay, and it was nothing that could really be traced. Wyatt Earp told the San Francisco Examiner in August of 1896, Doc was a dentist whom necessity had made a gambler, a gentleman whom disease had made a frontier vagabond, a philosopher whom life had made a caustic wit, a long, lean, ash wand fellow nearly dead of consumption, at the same time the most skillful gambler and the nerviest, speediest, deadliest man with a six-gun I ever knew. Doc's obituary, printed November 14, 1887, in the Leadville, Colorado Carbonate Chronicle, may say it best. There is scarcely one in the country who had acquired a greater notoriety than Doc Holliday, who enjoyed the reputation of being one of the most fearless men on the frontier, and whose devotion to his friends in the climax of the fiercest ordeal was inextinguishable. It was this, more than any other faculty, that secured him the reverence of a large circle who were prepared on the shortest notice to rally to his relief.